unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grand Thamasha, a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in the Hindu Sun Times. I'm your host, Milan Vaishnav. In September 2020, Indian lawmakers approved three controversial agricultural bills that the Modi government says will boost growth in the farming sector by increasing private investment. The bills were passed amidst an uproar on the floor of parliament. That uproar would soon manifest outside of parliament as tens of thousands of farmers took the streets on the outskirts of Delhi to protest the passage of these laws. Today, the government and the farmers are locked in a months-long standoff with everyone from the Supreme Court to foreign governments weighing in on the confrontation. To discuss the farm laws, the motivations behind them, their likely consequences, and the political fallout, I'm joined today by two experts who have studied the ins and outs of Indian agriculture. Shomitra Chatterjee is Assistant Professor of Economics at Penn State University. His research focuses on agricultural markets and market power in agricultural supply chains in India. Shomitra, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Milan. It's a pleasure to be here. And we're also joined by Mikla Krishnamurthy, Associate Professor of Sociology and Anthropology at Ashoka University and Senior Fellow at the Center for Policy Research. She has studied agriculture at the grassroots for the better part of 15 years. Mekla, good to see you. Thanks so much, Milan. It's great to be here. So I should mention that both Shomitra and Mekla are the co-authors of a wide-ranging new study of agricultural markets in three Indian states that was published recently by the University of Pennsylvania. We will link to that new study uh, in the show notes. Shomitra, let me start by turning to you first. You know, just stepping back before we get into the nitty gritty of the laws themselves. You know, there is a widely held belief that Indian agriculture is stuck in a bad place. You know, you have farmers who have small land holdings. There's a lot of inefficient trading and marketing of produce. There are high levels of indebtedness. We're all familiar with the commentary about farmer suicides, you know, lots of wastage. Step back and kind of paint us a stylized picture of the state of Indian agriculture circa 2021. Right. Um, so the so the part about small land holdings is is true, but we also have to sort of ask small relative to what. Um, so the average farm size in India is less than a hectare. Uh, the median is about 1.5, but there is a great deal of regional heterogeneity. So if you go to Punjab, the average land holdings would be higher, let's say about two and a half hectares. If you went to Punjab, they would be even bigger, about three and a half hectares. So, so, but all of this is definitely very small compared to where we are recording the show in the United States, where land holdings would be up of 100 hectares. So you are you are very, very small. But that's also not the right comparison. We are a large country with a lot of people. If you look at China, for example, which would be a, a, a better comparison, uh, uh, the, land hold, the, the land size distribution it is, is, is pretty similar. Um, there isn't much difference. On the second part about there being inefficient trade, again, we have to kind of specify what inefficiency means. Um, it was true earlier. It's not so true now. There isn't that much inefficiency in movement. So um, these days you don't hear that there are regional shortages. It does not happen that one part of the country doesn't have onions and the other part has a lot of onions. When you have uh, a, a scarcity in onions, it's almost everywhere in the country, and you have to import from abroad, which means that our supply chains are good at noticing price arbitrages and goods move. There is inefficiency of another kind, which is the inefficiency of scale. So we talked about scale in farm sizes. There is also scale in transportation and intermediation. So you see a lot of small tempos and vans transporting goods because these are kind of small scale entrepreneurs who are very active in these chains. Um, um, there would be some increase in value, some reduction in wastage if these tempos um, were replaced with large trucks. Uh, uh, but there will be a cost, which would be the livelihoods of the people who are engaged in that sector currently. And we have to sort of think about what the trade-offs are. Again, on wastage, yes, there, I mean, there are many numbers floating around. I think I've only seen one systematic study. It's very hard to sort of um, systematically capture how much wastage is. As compared to the West, the stark difference is that there's a lot of wastage on our um, farms, 
in the supply chain and 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 so on. Um, whereas in the in the West, most of the wastage would happen at the consumer end. Um, you would be pretty efficient um, in the. I mean, in in our field work, for example, I have seen that a lot of the marketplaces, um, the mandis and so on, will have a pit. So whatever uh, vegetables let's say is not sold by the end of the day is, is sort of thrown in the spit and partly the reason is that there you have a lack of storage uh, 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 in absence of formal storage perishable it's it makes no sense for anybody to keep perishables overnight um, and then that gets wasted uh, uh, but but again we don't have very credible numbers as to whether the wastage is 40 percent or 20 percent those exercises haven't been done systematically so so Mikla you know, you spent years living and working in Madhya Pradesh, studying the functioning of one particular agricultural market or mandi known as Harada Mandi. I remember our conversations going years back when you were a graduate student and a postdoc, you know, showing pictures of, of, of these giant stocks of grain and other things. Before getting into the economics of the mandi system, just tell us a bit about the role that mandis play in the daily life for farmers. You know, how many are there? How do they work? You know, sort of what do they look like? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Milan. You know, in some ways, the question you're asking is also typical of how we've sort of started to think about them, right? Now, mandi in Madhya Pradesh is very different from a mandi in, um, you know, uh, Punjab or Haryana. It's quite different from a mandi in Karnataka. Um, although they all share now, you know, this common kinship because we associate them with agricultural produce market committees, which APMC is. But it's worth remembering that the mandi itself, right, is part of a much older system of trade, exchange, and commercialization, which has existed in India over a very long period of time. So even Harda Mandi, you know, the, uh, the town itself as a trading town finds mention in the 1860s. 68 settlement report. It finds mention in gazetteers as an important trading hub, right? Um, and uh, when I spoke to people about the history of this mandi, uh, people could date it back to a time before it was an APMC mandi, <clears throat> which was before it was an agricultural produce marketing committee mandi. So there are, you know, we have to remember that words like mandi, heart, bazaar, ganj, these are old terms in, you know, uh, different parts of India refer to different kinds of market sites um, that also point to a very uneven history of commercialization. So Indian agricultural markets have actually been commercialized for a very, very long time, which is, again, something we forget. These processes of commercialization have existed and coexisted with subsistence production, with production for own consumption, um, you know, in rural areas, and with trade and exchange. Um, and different commodities have been commercialized in different waves at different times, right? So this is the overall history. So in that sense, the, um, the mandi is a very old form. Um, and you could have regulated mandis, you could have unregulated mandis or privately regulated mandis, um, and uh, each mandi will have its own history and prehistory uh, that you know you, you will come across and when it actually emerged. Um, and so, in that sense, you know it's part of a very complex and old and dynamic landscape of exchange and trade uh, that's existed in different parts of India. So, for farmers, depending on where you are, um, you have very different relationships with this site, and as you can imagine with all these sites of exchange they are social economic uh, and political sites right and bazaars have always been sites of politics uh, as much as they've been sites of economics and these are all places where kinship networks small firms so you know this is the you know the larger dynamics of these market sites um, you know the question that you're asking is about agricultural produce marketing committee mandis, so APMC mandis, and the origin of that species uh, is, you know, a little different. So there we seem to have, when it comes to formally regulated wholesale markets, about somewhere between 6,500 and 7,000 of them by record, of which about 2,000, 2,500 are primary markets, like principal market yards, and um, the rest of them are uh, Submarket yards connected to this. This this word APMC, this acronym, uh, is at the heart of a lot of the debate right now. And I think if you read uh, the op-ed pages of the Indian newspapers, 
um, they are often painted as the bad guy, right? As somehow a major impediment to farmers' prosperity. And if only we could find some way to do away with them or marginalize them, we would get farmers would get to a better place. Does this have, in your view, some truth to it, or is this a kind of overly simplistic caricature of the APMC system? Yeah. Um, so uh, this is really interesting uh, because so the origin of this species, the APMC mandi, um, and you know a number of people have pointed this out, but um, it, it has colonial antecedents. Um, it's an old form, and it was first mentioned sort of you know in the Royal Commission in 1928. Royal Commission on Agriculture talks about the importance of properly regulated markets, and by properly regulated markets they meant physical you know, local physical markets, which would be governed by a local management committee, which would have representation of farmers, local traders, government officials, uh, even laborers, right? And that you would have a local market committee under a state at that time, provincial law. Uh, and then, you know, from independence onward, we start seeing them as state laws, where you'd have state laws. And so we don't actually have an APMC Act for the country. So people always say repeal the APMC Act or reform the APMC Act. There are no APMC Acts. There are agricultural produce marketing acts that different states have, um, and they're all different state laws. And under these, there's a common feature, which is in many of these acts, you see this form, which is the APMC, which is not the Mandi itself, but is the committee a local committee that governs the agricultural market yard. Now, these spaces were important, and it's, I think it's worth stepping back to understand why they were created. Now, the assumption was, as Shumitra has already sort of given us a picture, that you know India has a very large number of very small farmers, and that in any region or any local market area, you will have a very large number of sellers who are agricultural, so farmer sellers, and a relatively small number of buyers. So this means that you have a tendency towards, or you could, depending on if it's poorly regulated and you have market power of a certain kind, monopsonies, right? Where you have a very large number of sellers, small number of buyers. And the idea was that to give farmers a fair price, you needed local markets, physical markets, because these are, after all, physical commodity markets, where farmers could go and engage in regulated exchange, which meant that, you know, under these, in these market yards, under the oversight of these committees, you would have auctions, you would have standardization of weights and measures, you would have payment settlement systems that would ensure that farmers are paid on time and fully, and you would have dispute resolution mechanisms, because of course you will have disputes, so uh, that you would have quick and local dispute resolution mechanisms. So over time, what happened is that some states did a fairly good job of implementing these Mundi laws over time. Other states actually never implemented them. So they made the laws, but didn't really implement. And so, you know, depending on where you go in India, you might see quite dynamic mandis, which have strong um, systems, sometimes very strong interests as well, local control of traders, all of that you may also see. You may see very well-regulated mandis with relatively good infrastructure, few of them, unfortunately. Um, you can go to certain other states, like if you went even before Bihar repealed its act or to Odisha, where on paper there is a Mandi Act, but on the ground you may not see a Mandi, or you may see an empty Mandi yard where all the exchange actually happens outside. And in some states, notably Kerala, for example, in the 1960s, decided not to have a Mandi Act because an APMC Act, because they had plantation crops and they went with a system of commodity boards. So depending on where you go, you see, you know, a very different um, sort of story. And the term Mandi itself might be different, you know, for different people. So in Odisha, Mandi was where wheat, I mean, was where paddy procurement happened, right? The government regulated yard where paddy procurement happened. In Punjab and Haryana, it's a very very well-appointed, familiar institution. Uh, in Madhya Pradesh and Karnataka, in certain districts, very strong mandis. In other districts, relatively weak or no mandis whatsoever. Uh, in Bihar, you have mandis, but they are not regulated. And often they would be called bazaar samitis, 
from a previous generation of regulation, which is not present today. So all this to say there's a lot of diversity in how they got rolled out. But over the years, commission after commission has made it very clear that we never built enough APMC mandus. So, you know, although in theory we were supposed to have this big network of mandis, this is one of the reasons that a very large amount of produce in India doesn't go through mandis at all uh, currently. It's either sold at villages or goes in through separate channels, but we never created enough mandis. And we also have a system of 22,000 to 25,000 hearts, which are weekly bazaars. And those have been very, very poorly invested in over many, many years. So, um, you know, on the one hand, you have this system where we think of it as a highly vested monopolistic system. On the other hand, the reality is that a lot of trade doesn't even go through Mondays and many states don't have enough of them and never invested in them in the first place. I mean, it's it sort of... Uh... You know, there are so many sectors in which, right, there's a kind of reality on paper versus a, a reality in, in, in practice. Let me just ask Shamitra for a second about the reality on paper or the new reality on paper. You know, there are these new uh, three new farm laws. Um, that's really they're at the heart of this uh, ongoing debate. I'm wondering if you could just kind of give us a quick thumbnail sketch about the laws and what exactly they do. Right. So it's basically the first one, which is, I guess, the most controversial one, which is the Farmers Produce uh, Trade and Commerce Act, um, or as it's called the Mundi Bypass Act. So what it allows um, traders to do, so it, it, although it is sold as sort of giving farmers more freedom, it really gives the traders more freedom in the sense that now, so earlier, if you had the APMCs, this act does not dissolve the APMCs. The APMCs stay as is, but whatever part of the state was not under the APMC Act, um, um, they are now called free trade zones, um, and agricultural trade can happen here. So traders can buy uh, uh, in the free trade zones if transaction or exchange happens in that place, the traders only need to have a PAN card. Um, you don't need any other registration. Um, um, there is no tax, no levy that has to be paid to anybody. Um, but importantly now, dispute resolution now rests with the subdivisional magistrate. So earlier, as Mekla said, dispute resolution was a function that the Mandi performed. Now imagine that if a petty trader cheats a farmer, um, you have to show up at the SDM who then has to appoint a committee and uh, uh, somehow resolve this dispute. Um, it limits the power of the court. So the act explicitly says that um, the central government or the state government for any action that it takes under this act cannot be taken to court. Further, the, the dispute resolution that now has to be done by the SDM, the courts have, the civil courts have no jurisdiction over those matters. Um, it does, um, 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 it so by this by this new law, the states can no longer prohibit interstate trade. So um, one state cannot say that there is a shortage of supply of potatoes in my state. I will not allow potatoes to go into other states. So it liberalizes interstate trade, but remember that it does nothing to international trade. The central government can still come in and ban export of commodities when international prices are high. Um, um, that's sort of broadly what the Mundi Bypass Act does. Now, we have to understand the diversity also because the state still reserve the right to declare what part of the state is an APMC. So Punjab, I don't know what they did, but Punjab was claiming that they are going to declare the entire state as an APMC, in which case this act de facto wouldn't apply. Um, Bihar did not have, have an APMC. So now all of the state is a free trade area. But from our field experience, all the traders were sort of small. I don't think anybody had a PAN card. So by this law, all of that trade is now illegal. And we'll have to kind of wait and watch what happens. In MP, this causes further confusion. Now imagine your house being a Mandi. So that's APMC, but the road outside your house is no longer APMC. It's a free trade zone. 
So now you are actually if that if you believe that the traders had more market power had market power now they can just step outside on the road and can buy without any regulation so in principle this can also increase their market power so that's kind of that's the main sort of more talked about bill the other bills are so there's one sort of contract farming law which basically says that that contract farming law now overrides any other contract farming law of the states uh, it sort of lays down what you can contract on it gives farmers some protection so it keeps the private parties from taking over or contracting on the land itself of the farmer but again like dispute resolution and those things are are are, are kind of with the sub subdivisional magistrate as opposed to the apmc in the in the earlier world and the last one is like like not a new act it's an amendment bill it's an amendment to the essential commodities bill uh, essential commodities act um, uh, where it sort of liberalizes some of the stocking limits but it still maintains that in extreme situations broadly defined wars famines some kind of price spikes the government can still come in and regulate um, storage and movement of goods so so mekla you know, one of the central contentions uh, or, or focal points in the debate is over center state relations, right? And many people have pointed out that, look, at the end of the day, agriculture is a state subject. So why did the center at this point in time feel moved to push through legislation that would liberalize the sector, help build a nationwide market? You know, what are the justifications it is using to intervene on what had previously been seen by many governments as outside the central government's jurisdiction. Yeah. So, you know, I'm going to take off a little bit from what Shumitra just said in terms of the acts. And I think it's really important because he's laid the ground and actually explained something very important. Uh, you know, we often hear that these acts are the culmination of a process that has been ongoing for a rather long time and that there's nothing particularly new about them, that they were actually debated. So although agriculture is a state subject, this is something that has been discussed and debated and worked through. And therefore, this, this is after a long period of consultation that these acts have been brought in. Uh, but I think this is exactly at the heart of both the center state um, sort of uh, debate, as well as the substantive differences that these laws bring about in the whole structure of regulated marketing. Right. So I think, you know, one of the things that uh, you know, we need to keep in mind is that over the last 20 years, what has been suggested and, you know, I was giving you a sense of how Mundis have, you know, developed over time. And in many places, even though they played a very, very important role, there was this sense that Mundis were restrictive and that you needed to have some liberalization. But the, the argument always was that because agricultural marketing is a state subject, you would proceed through model acts, right? And so, in fact, it was two NDA governments in 2003 and then in 2017, both of which brought model acts. The idea was that you set up a framework and you, you know, allow the states to adapt, to figure out how they would want to set up their own laws. And the reason for that is that agricultural marketing is quite distinct from trade. Agricultural marketing is the first transaction between farmers and the first buyers of their produce. The, this transaction has always been considered very closely linked to production systems, right? Because it's very difficult on the ground level to separate for a farmer uh, production and marketing. And so you actually have a very important, um, you know, interrelationship there. And for that reason, marketing was always seen as distinct from trade, right? Trade is actually considered a concurrent list, right? Interstate trade. So um, the idea always was that the governance of primary markets would be left to the states. And over the last 20 years, the center has sort of come up with these model laws, which have you know, moved towards opening up the money system. The difference between those laws and what Shumitra has just described was that there was a comprehensive framework for regulation, right? You didn't create market areas and trade areas. You created a sense that here, okay, now these are all the different kinds of sites that you would have under regulated marketing. 
uh, where state governments would decide about taxation, state governments would decide about the modalities of things, but they would allow private sector actors to buy outside mandis. Uh, and, you know, interestingly, prior to the introduction of these new laws, most governments and most state governments that had APMC laws in place already had made the major changes that were required, right? They had already allowed direct marketing so corporations could buy outside mandis. They had, most of them had, many of them had allowed contact farming. Uh, they had created single point levies so you don't have multiple points of taxation. Uh, they had created the possibilities of having private market yards. Many of them had deregulated fruits and vegetables. So there were a lot of changes that state governments had already made. But notably, those changes ensured that trade outside of the mandis was also regulated. So you did have to take a license. Increasingly, state governments had also created the mechanisms to take a single license to operate in that particular state. Um, and so there were various efforts underway to make this sort of uh, system where you had both trade within APMCs and outside, but within a common framework of regulation. So, you know, it's a very important question to ask what changed, right? Um, and whether, so there has been for the last several years, the sense that these reforms were partial that they weren't adequate, the pace wasn't enough, that, you know, states had kept certain exemptions for certain commodities, that they had kept taxes high even outside, you know, and, and kept certain types of control. As Shumitra said, some states would impose stock limits and, um, you know, barriers to movement. So all of these questions had been raised. Um, whether at this moment in 2020, in the middle of a pandemic, via ordinances, you should bring about a fundamental change in the governance of these systems, right, overriding states. Um, and this is, you know, something I don't think anybody had anticipated. Um, and I think it's very important for us to ask whether it's really necessary, because I think interstate trade could have been, you know, something that the government could have come in on. Um, and created, you know, an interstate council for agriculture where state governments could negotiate some of these questions and figure out how you get greater synchronization. Um, but I think given the complexity and diversity of the evolution of agriculture markets, it makes little sense to impose a central law uh, in a state subject of, of this kind. So, so Shumitra, I mean, when you listen to the arguments made by defenders of the new laws, they say, look, uh, these new laws are going to do a couple of things. They're going to bring in greater competition in agricultural markets. That is going to lead to lower costs of intermediation. It is going to lead to better infrastructure. It is going to lead to better storage along the supply chain and less wastage as a result. It's going to lead to better uh, as better price discovery, which is something, you know, economists like yourself uh, uh, believe in. And yet, tens of thousands of farmers are vehemently protesting these new laws. So why are the farmers so up in arms over legislation that the government says would help them in all of these different ways? Right. So before I answer your question, I just want to, I just want to add to what Mekla was already saying. I think that uh, understanding the economics of the reforms is also important so this is the, the 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 tagline of this is either providing more options to farmers or creating market integration right i just want to stress that this is not market integration market integration would have been something like the gst which was creating a uniform set of taxes across states here you have the existing APMCs and now, so earlier you had variation across the taxes across the states. Now you also have variation within states, within in, states. in taxes. So that's creating market segmentation. And as Mekla was saying, even with market integration, and we have written at different places that market integration brings all sorts of things, including increases in income volatility. And we have to sort of think through whether those are desirable things um, for us. Now, to sort of come to your question about why are farmers protesting, I think we have to sort of understand that 
a lot of the protests that we observe in the in the mainstream media is from Punjab and Haryana. And there it sort of gets linked to the minimum support price issue, which is outside these acts. So these acts don't mention anything about minimum support prices or changing the system. But the anxiety is that a system of public procurement that existed in these states um, might slowly go away. Uh, uh, and for those farmers, remember the minimum support price, I'm not arguing right now whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just saying from their point of view, this was like receiving a fixed salary uh, uh, two times a year for the last 40 years. Now, you say that there is now a threat that overnight the system will change and you are going to move into a system of uncertain incomes. That might be, you, you can even argue that that might be good for the environment and so on. But from the farmer's point of view, that sort of subjecting them to greater risks. And this is an activity which is a high risk activity. Uh, uh, our crop insurance program does not work very well. Unlike most other countries in the West, which provide both insurance for yield risk, but also insurance for price risk. So in the United States, for example, if the government follows counter-cyclical trade policy, i.e. instituting export bans when there is a shortage, they adequately compensate the farmers for the price loss. In India, we don't have such a system. In absence of any other proper form of support, Whenever the minimum support price exists as a policy and, and there is government sort of involvement in procurement, that is something that farmers deeply rely on. And if you threaten to take that away, that creates anxieties. And the second sort of anxiety is related to um, um, fear of, of, of um, co large corporates having even more market power uh, 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 in the state. So this is like saying that the, the intermediaries were there, maybe they were fleecing you a little bit, but the, the margins were small. Once the corporates come in, those margins are going to increase even more. Again, we don't, we can talk about this. In India, we have had whatever experiences we have had, the thing is mixed, but there is no systematic study. If you look at systematic studies elsewhere, um, um, there is a recent paper on Kenya which shows that entry of agribusinesses in an unregulated system um, went against farmers. So they kept consumer prices constant and they instead pushed margins against farmers. If you look at studies on the dairy sector in the United States, it's the same story that a dairy farmer in the United States actually told me that, you know, the vol the volumatization of the dairy sector in the United States has killed small farmers. Now, you can argue that, well, maybe small farmers shouldn't be farming in the first place, but the sad reality of India is where are they going to go? If you're going to push them too much, that's entry into unemployment because our other sectors are not um, functioning well in the first place. So I think that those things are, are, are resulting in a lot of anxieties. It is also unfair to say that all the protests are Punjab and Haryana. I think those are the most visible protests. But if you look at a lot of local reporting, um, um, there, is, there, there is stuff happening in, in MP. There is stuff happening in Maharashtra. It is always when people have something to lose. Of course, like sugar fake, sugar cane farmers are not going to protest because sugar cane follows a completely different supply chain. So it does not matter to them. But wherever it matters, wherever farmers think that um, they can be hurt, there, there is some form of protest out here. Mekla? Yeah. No, also to say that even sugarcane farmers are protesting in UP, distinct from this act. So actually what has happened is the acts have also become the focal point for many different kinds of claims um, and, and, you know, sort of expressions of distress across agrarian India. Um, and we should remember that this is not the first time. I mean, in 2018, a very large number of farmers, uh, you know, were in Delhi protesting. We had seen what happened in Madhya Pradesh, in Mansoor. We also saw, you know, farmers in Maharashtra. And one of the things that's actually quite distinctive about this 
period and this phase in you know protests is that unlike a previous period where you really saw these protests really were only led by large farmers and there was a very clear sense that this was those who were actually benefiting from the system you know asking for sugarcane arrears the large farmers from you know dark farmers of up and from punjab what you actually see uh, is the coalescing of a range of very diverse interests including small holders including laborers um including tribal farmers that have come together over these years and i think that's because there's you know an actual expression of general distress in agrarian india and the terms of their engagement in the indian economy so these are often not very visible in delhi um but if you travel in the field and you know you are present and then you will see this expressed repeatedly across different crops different cropping systems and groups and sizes of farmers uh but also i want to mention that the lack of protest doesn't necessarily at all mean you know appreciation or even knowledge that these laws have changed so you know um our colleague jeff witso had done this research you know some years after the uh, apmc laws in bihar had been repealed where farmers didn't even know that the laws had changed and there had been no change in their conditions because they prior to that still sold in the village and after the change also sold in the village because the way the market structure had been organized in bihar apmcs were for bilateral exchange between intermediaries commission agents and other buyers and not set up for you know exchange by farmers so you know the fact that they weren't saying anything or weren't protesting uh doesn't necessarily mean the laws were working in their favor uh but sometimes that the the change simply passed them by you know and so it bypass reform is not just the mandi it's often the farmer that is bypassed in these kinds of reforms um i do want to make one other quick point uh, you know to just point to what shmitra said i think all the evidence is that shown us over the years that deregulation in the context of unequal market power right only strengthens the interests of those who are more powerful in the market right so even a mandi which we know is susceptible to being captured by local interests where traders can cartelize and can, is still a publicly regulated market so if farmers organize there they can demand that the market change and that was the story that one was able to actually capture over all those years in a place like madhya pradesh right where the same market which was extremely non functional and dysfunctional over many years when farmers started mobilizing when the state started investing in both infrastructure and regulatory capacity by putting better regulators better front line regulators in the mandis itself you started seeing a change uh, in the way in which that market operated secondly these are markets where price discovery is very important right farmers go into these markets and you know the point you mentioned milan that you know the people who support these laws are saying that this is a chance for better price discovery but better price discovery requires price information it requires a good market intelligence system and the new laws don't have any system for recording transactions outside of the mandis so presumably if these markets are going to provide greater competition and the trade areas are going to you would want to have a minimal uh, system of actually recording transactions and increasing visibility right so that you have better price discovery um but that is missing completely so there are design flaws in the system there's the regulatory fragmentation problem and i think in this case it's a bypassing of the first principles of regulation right why do you need regulation why do you need well regulated primary markets for farmers before you open it up so so let me just ask you whoever wants to take this you know about next steps right so we have this impasse where the government has signaled its willingness to essentially hit the pause button on the implementation of these laws uh which will buy it time to negotiate with farmers you know farmers have said uh, at least the leadership of the farmer protest is that you know we are not going to stop until we see the full scale repeal of these laws so what are ways out and i want to get your opinion on two ways out that people talk about one is to say the government could hardwire into legislation a guarantee around the minimum support price right this floor below which 
uh, prices will not fall, they could essentially um, give some kind of hard coded guarantee to farmers, right? Say, whatever happens, we, we have your back. The second is to kick it back to the states and say, okay, we've passed these laws. If the states want to amend this law in a way that might contravene the federal law, go ahead and do so. And then we'll get this kind of experimentation. What are your thoughts? Maybe, Shumitra, I'll start with you on whether either of these two paths seem likely and or viable. Uh, so on the first thing, I think I think coding a, coding a floor price in any law could be could have very damaging consequences. Um, it could kill the market. So so remember in Punjab you have an MSP that always binds because the government always buys, but that also means that there is no private market. Um, uh, 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 that will lead to problems of all other kinds. You might have excess of crops that you don't want to consume. You might underproduce things that you um, really want. Um, um, I am more in sort of, I think Bharat Ramaswamy wrote an op-ed in the Indian Express uh, 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 where he articulated a possible pathway because we are in such an impasse. He basically said that right now, most of the states in India are, are BJP ruled states. So first, right now, just stall, first show proof of concept, show that this works or some iteration of this works. It has to be done at the state level because each state in India is very different. We are like, uh, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of where you are in, let's say, the agricultural development path, each state is is just very different from each other. So it has to be done and designed at the state level. The only thing the center can do is, which is a good thing, which is uh, we are a federal union and therefore there shouldn't be barriers to movement of goods within the country. But besides that, I think states should have the autonomy to to do whatever they want. This can serve as a guiding structure which they can adapt or reject. Uh, uh, and then once you have a proof of concept, then you have to sort of, again, come back to the negotiation table, do it the way GST was done. Remember, again, with the GST, we did not get our most, the best case, right, which was one rate for everything. But what was important about GST was that everybody who was involved was able to get the states on the table and agree to a common cause which is when it becomes a long-lasting policy solution. and Well, uh, and just to add to that, that there was an institutional mechanism, namely Council, the GST yeah. Council, made up of the center of the states, which then is the governing body as things go forward, right? So if you want to amend, reform, tweak, the center of the states have a joint... A mechanism for doing so right and and then after that like if, if states then want to do an msp they should be free to do an msp they want to procure enough they can procure enough given their finances and they will then have to find a way to sell the, those excess crops but i think states should just get more autonomy in this and we have to sort of figure out a solution through the federal structure where through a council-like system, you can negotiate and so on. Mekla, what's a way out in your view? Yeah, so, I mean, look, I think the the, the importance of going back, um, you know, we said this even about ENAM, which was brought as a scheme and then was plugged into the states, that... Um, you know, we need to go from the dashboard to the drawing board, right? We need to go back to some first principles. We need to understand the arrangements that the current, that currently exist. Um, I do think committing to a process where the states lead reform is incredibly important. Um, and this law doesn't build in the space for the states. Um, there is no architecture at the state level. In fact, even the dispute resolution mechanism, you know, is really about districts. Um, and then it goes to the center. So, you know, it has, and usually when you have laws around uh, things which are fundamentally also state subjects, you create an architecture, an institutional architecture at the state level, and you empower that architecture to, you know, take certain critical decisions. These are missing in these laws, right? Um, and therefore, I think it's incredibly important to recommit to that process uh, and let the states lead this. But I do want to point that we are in a funny moment because the Supreme Court is still to, um, you know, take up the question of constitutionality. So uh, there are lots of questions that both state governments have as well as uh, a whole range of private actors. 
who have about, you know, what is likely to happen. Uh, there's a confusion about whether the center can, in fact, suspend these laws without going back to parliament. Uh, so there's a whole range of very complicated technical issues uh, that have, you know, still not to be figured out and on which there's very little clarity. But I think the overall thrust of, you know, going back to the states is critical. Um, I do want to just sort of make one key point, um, and it brings in the MSP point also a little bit. But look, Indian agricultural markets are overwhelmingly private already, right? So the idea that you have to bring in the private sector is a, a strange one because these are overwhelmingly private actors, but they are private, uh, overwhelmingly small scale private actors, right? You're talking about small farmers, small traders, small labor, etc., you know, all the way to retailers. And what we have found in round after round of field work is that this is not an inefficient system necessarily. Uh, each of these actors play important roles and critical roles uh, in the system, um, and uh, but they are small. Now, how do we think about this? So the idea that if you simply deregulate, large-scale corporate capital will come and build market infrastructure, will build supply chains, simply has not happened to the degree and the extent. And we should remember that FDI and retail was allowed in 2012. It was a big move that happened. Similarly, we had, um, you know, uh, major changes in APMC acts, and many of these private actors have been on the ground for years. Uh, contract farming has happened in states like Punjab and in Tamil Nadu for years. So we have a lot of experience to learn from this. And one thing this experience does tell us is that the government's role is not simply to correct market failures, but it is also, particularly in agriculture, where we have food and nutrition security on the one hand and agroecology on the other hand. It plays a very, very important role in terms of shaping the system as well. And so, you know, in the absence of well-directed public investments, which are region-specific, and a much more comprehensive approach to the kinds of supports that farmers need, which could include and will include MSP-based you know, price supports in some areas, but also require a whole range of other kinds of interventions, a return to thinking about what would local area, agroecological planning look like, where would you direct investment, um, I don't think it will happen. And um, I mean, all the evidence shows that, and it's not just Bihar, you know, even in states which have had this, the, the private public sector and public investment has played a critical role. So you know, one has to remember that it's not Mondays versus private corporations, right? Mondays are regulated marketplaces. Many uh, private companies and corporations buy in Mondays. They take licenses and bid in Monday auctions. So we have to be able to understand the difference between a regulated marketplace uh, and, uh, you know, a private or public buyers. So just to add, I think what Mekla is also saying at the heart of it, what lies is, I think we also need to think about what the long term vision for Indian agriculture is. Which which we haven't which we haven't sat down and 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 discussed and deliberated right because there are many internal contradictions. On one hand, we say that we want the scale of everything to become bigger, right? We want larger corporations, larger intermediation, everything. And at the same time, we say that we want to double smallholder farmer income. Uh, uh, increasing scale at one place means that the smallholders will go out of farming. And, and that cannot be discussed without discussing the vision for the econ Indian economy itself, because, I mean, as kind of in, the, in sort of the work with Arvind Subramanian, we showed that uh, uh, when it comes to low-skill manufacturing, India is a major laggard. So now if you try to kick people out of the system, they will enter not into productive employment elsewhere, as Sir Arthur Lewis would argue for, but into unemployment, and that can have really disastrous consequences. My guests on the show today are Shumitra Chatterjee and Mikla Krishnamurthy. They are the co-authors of a brand new study of agricultural markets in three Indian states, Bihar, Odisha, and Punjab. Uh, this is a report published by the Center for the Advanced Study of India at the University of Pennsylvania and supported by the Gates Foundation. Shumitra and Mikla, this is a very complicated story that is still a, a moving target, but thanks to you both for helping unpack it for our listeners. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.
Grantamasha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindu Sun Times. This podcast is an HT Smartcast original and is available on hdsmartcast.com, India's fastest growing podcasting producing platform. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to rate and review. It helps others find the show more easily. For more information about the show and to find the writing we referenced on this week's episode, visit our website, grantthemasha.com. Production assistance comes from Jonathan Kay. Tim Martin is our audio engineer, and Maya Krishna Rogers is our executive producer. Thanks for listening, and see you next week. This was a Hindustan Times production brought to you by HD Smartcast. HD Smartcast.